try and produce what might have been the perfect open top sports car in the 1950s and 60s. A daily driver during the week, a track day car at the weekends and a whole heap of fun every day of the week. From its roots as a show car that was labelled a death trap to a much loved icon of freedom on the open road, the Triumph TR cars have it all. For much of their life they battled MGs and Porsches for victory in the open top arena, having an amazing 28 year production run and it still inspires new open tops into the 21st century. This is the Triumph TR story. The TR car story starts with the Triumph Roadster, produced from 1946 to 1949. After World War II, the government encouraged companies to export or die to kickstart the battered British economy, but Triumph also saw there was money to be made in the US sports car market. The Triumph Roadster was odd in that it had a bench seat that could accommodate three in the front and a dicky seat in the boot that could accommodate two more, with their own windscreen but without seat belts. I'm guessing this wouldn't score five stars in today's end cap safety tests. The top speed was 75 miles an hour and the 0-60 time was slightly faster than a snail at 34 seconds. Triumph knew they could do better. They saw the success MG were having in North America with their T-Type and Jaguar with their XK120. After an unsuccessful attempt to buy Morgan, their first try was the Triumph TRX concept introduced in 1950. Despite looking stunning to modern eyes, in 1950 it looked old fashioned. They found it was expensive to produce, only felt safe when a passenger was there to balance the weight and was a doppelganger for the already released Austin A90 Atlantic which was selling badly. So Triumph went back to the drawing board and started delving into the parts bin pulling out the front suspension from the Mayflower, the engine from Standard's Vanguard, an engine that was originally built for the Ferguson TR20 tractor, and the chassis from the Standard 8. It needed to be inexpensive to build as they weren't expecting high sales. From this unlikely combination, they created what they called the Triumph 20 TS. The car was little more than a prototype, and was shown at the Earls Court Motor Show in October 1952 to a mixed reaction. After the show, Standard's owner, Sir John Black, asked BRM test driver Ken Richardson to try the car out. He ran his tests and found it was low on power, called it a death trap, and the most bloody awful car I've ever driven. Little did they know that the 20 TS, this horrible mess of a car, would become known as the Triumph TR1. Over the winter, Triumph's engineers got to work fixing these problems so they could save their sports car program. The engine was tuned so instead of a top speed of 80 miles an hour, it now went over 100. The brake size was increased, the chassis stiffened and lengthened, and both front and rear suspension were modified. It seems they worked on everything except the cigarette lighter, which was handy as it didn't have a cigarette lighter. In just five months they released the car as a Triumph TR2 and the public loved it. It was one of the first cars to offer an optional hard top made from futuristic fiberglass. The soft top featured side curtains to prevent rain getting in due to its very low doors. There were problems initially with road holding, but it was fixed by larger rear brakes and radial tyres, something recently productised by Michelin. With a 0-60 time under 12 seconds, which was fast for the 1950s, Triumph wanted to showcase the TR2's prowess by taking it racing, and from 1954 it competed in and won many events. The public took notice which helped to fuel more sales. Over 8,600 TR2's were made, with the majority heading to North America. Triumph continued to race its cars well into the 1970s to help drum up sales. In 1955, just 12 months later, Triumph released the TR3 with its egg crate grille. The engine output had been increased from 90 brake horsepower to 100 and the following year the TR3 fitted front disc brakes as standard, a first for a British car. They had good reason to keep tweaking the car. It was selling well 
but in 1953 the Roots company had released their Sunbeam Alpine. Jaguar had updated the XK120 to the XK140 in 1954, and MG had just released the MGA. Triumph continued to compete with the Morgan Plus 4, but this was relatively friendly competition as Morgan shared the same engine made by Triumph's parent company, Standard. And that's just the British competition. These cars were constantly challenged by Porsche's latest and greatest models. Another update came in 1957. While it was still called the TR3, owners referred to the update as the TR3A. It gained a wider, cheesy grin of a grille, exterior door handles, and a lockable boot. It seems these cars were popular with thieves as well. The TR3 was so popular, the original door molds got worn out and had to be replaced. Probably a good problem for a car company to have. Given the success Triumph was having with their open top sports cars, they wanted the next version, the TR4, to keep ahead of the competition. They brought in Giovanni Michelotti, who had already done a great job restyling their standard Vanguard. He created a design that set the style of the Triumph TR cars well into the 1970s. The doors were heightened, allowing for wind down windows, negating the need for fiddly side curtains. The larger rear allowed for much more boot space. One novel option was a hard top with a fixed rear section and a metal roof that could be removed, something Triumph called a Surrey top. It was made popular by Porsche five years later as the Targa top. The engine size was increased slightly to 2.1 litres by boring out the existing 2 litre engine, nudging the output to 105 brake horsepower and the top speed to 110 miles an hour. The wheel track was increased and the car gained synchromesh on all forward gears. The new style was needed to keep up with the competition. The Sunbeam Alpine was already making other cars look old fashioned, MG had their brand new midget, and Jaguar had just launched their admittedly more premium E Type with a top speed of over 150 miles an hour. The development of the TR4 came in the middle of an earthquake for Triumph being swallowed up by Leyland Motors in 1960. Leyland allowed the TR4 to go ahead, but stopped any of Triumph's motorsport involvement. This was a shame as many of the TR3 sales had come from their entry in competitions such as the Coupe des Alpes and the Le Mans 24 hour race. It seems someone at Triumph had a quiet word with Leyland management because by 1962 they were back racing again. The TR4 was a big step forward, but North American dealers were unsure how customers would react to it, so the TR3 continued production in parallel for another two years, informally known as the TR3B. The TR4 was a success, with over 40,000 sold. MG fought back in 1962 with their MGB Roadster, and customers praised the MG's superior suspension. Triumph had to improve, so the TR4's chassis was modified to take new independent rear suspension, proudly denoted with IRS badges on the back. The revised car was wider and 50 kilograms heavier. The grille changed once again to a straight, slat design. However, it retained its simple no-nonsense interior, except for new walnut trim. The TR4A was released in 1965. Although most welcomed the new revised suspension, two US distributors fought back and got Triumph to build TR4As with the old live axle system, offering the new independent suspension as an upgrade. As the North American market was so important, Triumph complied, so the new TR4A was retrofitted. With the success of the TR4, it was natural someone would try a coupe version. It was built not by Triumph, but by the Dove Company of Wimbledon, who produced the Dove GTR4 in 1963 with a light fiberglass roof. However, with a cost 30% higher than the TR4 hardtop and barely any extra room, not many were sold. But this didn't stop Triumph from creating their own coupe, the GT6, in 1966, built on the smaller Spitfire platform. Unfortunately, it also failed to sell well. As the 1960s rolled on, the US started implementing emissions legislation 
that started to rob the TR4 of power. Triumph's next car would need a bigger engine. Triumph's more powerful vision of the future was codenamed the Triumph Fury. Styled again by Giovanni Michelotti, who'd styled the TR4, this had the look of a larger Spitfire, a car he'd also designed. The plan was to use the larger inline six engine from the Triumph 2000, or possibly even a V8. Where the TR4 had a separate chassis, the Fury would use a monocoque body shell. A thoroughly modern car, but one that was killed off before it reached production. It's likely that management found it too expensive and looked for a cheaper TR4 update. Instead of Fury, we got Project Wasp. The TR4 would be lightly restyled by Michelotti using the existing chassis. The larger six cylinder engine would be used and the increased 150 brake horsepower would help counteract the new US emissions restrictions plus add-ons like air conditioning that sap the engine's power. It would also help it compete against new, more powerful cars like the MGC and would give it additional sporting appeal. The extra power would get the car to 60 in 8.2 seconds and on to 125 miles an hour. The car would be released as the TR5 in 1967. The engine was fitted with fuel injection, something quite rare in the 60s. As this was a new system, it was inevitable there would be teething problems. The car had a tendency to cut out when the fuel tank was around a quarter full, due to air pickup from the fuel tank into the new fuel injection system. As the 1970s approached, the competition against Japanese rivals increased. These were cheaper, which meant the TR5 had to remain affordable, meaning less money for investment in future models. These price pressures, plus tighter emission standards in the US, led to a much less powerful carburetted version of the TR5, dubbed the TR250. Despite releasing the TR5 in 1967, Triumph would release the TR6 just over a year later in January 1969. The big change was the new styling, performed by Carmen Gear of Germany as Michelotti was unavailable. The centre section was retained, but the front and rear were all new. By using clever design tricks, Carmen was able to use the doors and windows from the TR4. It produced a wonderfully proportioned look that proved to be a strong seller. By now, the British Motor Corporation had been subsumed by British Leyland, which meant both MG and Triumph were under the same wing. This allowed dealers to be rationalised, further reducing costs but it meant British Leyland had MG and Triumph cars that overlapped each other considerably. Before this merger, Triumph's attention had already turned to the TR6's successor, and with good reason. As the Fury concept hadn't gone to production, the car still used the 1953 Standard 8 chassis rather than having modern unibody construction. Triumph started on the Bullet and Lynx projects, Bullet would be a TR6 with a roll bar and T-bar like the Mark I Toyota MR2. The Lynx would be a Coupe GT like the previous Dove GTR4. Following the merger, there were concerns these projects were essentially a duplicate of MG's ADO21 project. In 1970, British Lane decided to kill off the MG name and focus purely on Triumph so development work on the Bullet and Lynx designs went ahead with a tentative production date of 1975. Spen King, the designer of the Range Rover, was brought in to bring the cars to reality. He travelled to the US to ask dealers what customers wanted from their new car. He was surprised to find out that owners wanted a simple, front-engined, rear-wheel drive car that was reliable and simple enough that it could be easily repaired at the side of the road. Maybe the last request was made because MGs and Triumphs were always breaking down. But halfway through development, management were having second thoughts. The new design seemed too conventional, which had some merit, especially compared to the rejected MG ADO21 design. They'd fallen in love with ADO71, which would turn into the Austin Princess, and wanted something more like that. Triumph tried to alter their designs to appease management, but it wasn't enough. Enter Harris Mann. He was Leyland's new star designer, after his work on the Morris Marina, Austin Princess, and Austin Allegro. 
he made a wonderful futuristic design with the TR7, managing to easily incorporate the new high-impact bumpers that US legislation demanded. The new car was up against more sophisticated competition like the Datsun 240Z and the mid-engined Porsche 914. With impending US legislation looking to all but outlaw open tops, British Leyland wasn't keen to spend its limited funds on low volume open tops when it was trying to win the volume sector back at home. The new car would have a roof and the open top MGB would be sold until legislation outlawed it. The Triumph Lynx project was greenlit and it was expected that other sports cars would be built off the same platform. British Leyland were thinking of making their own Ford Capri, which was turning into a runaway success, and a V8 model could be an updated Triumph Stag. The engines would be the four-cylinder from the Triumph Dolomite and the Range Rover's V8. The Lynx wasn't going to be technically sophisticated, but the ride and handling were greatly improved over the TR6. It was even one of the first cars to have a basic form of crumple zone. The TR7 was what people in the UK would call a Marmite car. That is, you either love it or you hate it. When the Italian car designer Giorgetto Giugiario first saw it, he stood back, walked around the other side, then remarked, Oh my God, they've done it to the other side as well. But there are some of us that love the TR7 look. As North America was the number one market for the new car, it was introduced there first in 1975. The V8 wasn't ready, so customers had to make do with a four-cylinder engine heavily hampered by US emissions legislation. It had just 90 brake horsepower compared to the TR6's 111 brake horsepower. In California, they had to make do with a paltry 76 brake horsepower. It was a disappointment for customers looking for a newer, faster car. The interior was much more comfortable than the previous basic TR6, but being the 1970s there was plastic everywhere and not a bit of walnut in sight. In 1976 the car was launched in the rest of the world, with the four-cylinder engine producing a much better 105 brake horsepower with a respectful 0-60 time of 9.4 seconds and a top speed of 110 miles an hour. Sadly, build quality wasn't good, which hurt sales both in North America and at home. Industrial action at the Speak plant delayed production, and there was further delay as production was moved to Canley. Both these factors meant shortages, just as the new car marketing blitz was hitting customers. By 1978, all thought of new TR7 derivatives had gone out of the window. British Leyland was broke, and what little money was left was being pumped into the new Austin Metro and Maestro projects. With one last throw of the dice for the TR7, engineers shoehorned the 3.5 litre V8 from the Range Rover and the Rover SD1 into the little car and called it the TR8, and in 1979 an open top version was launched. This was just what the North American market had asked for, with the upgraded engine providing up to 148 brake horsepower and a 0-60 time around 8 seconds. As production improved and the V8 and open top hit American shores, sales started to pick up. But if you know your geopolitical history from 1979, which I know you do, you'll know the Iranian revolution caused a global recession as it was a major oil exporter. The UK's attempts to battle 16% inflation adversely affected the US exchange rate, meaning the newly launched TR8 was now much more expensive. While journalists loved it, customers stayed away. At the end of 1980, production was moved yet again, this time to Soli Hull, where the SD1 was produced. But if proof was needed that the TR7 was the unluckiest car in history, the plant was scheduled for closure the following year. The TR series of cars ran for an amazing 28 years, selling over 350,000, providing thrills and motorsport fun. Open top cars are alive and well today with cars like the Fiat 124 Spider that not only look like TR cars of old, but get 160 brake horsepower out of a tiny 1.4 litre engine with a 0-60 time of just 6.9 seconds, and that's with an automatic gearbox. Engine technology has certainly moved on. If you like these videos and want to get early access to new videos, 
plus exclusive extra content, consider supporting me using the Patreon link below. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Let me know your experiences of the Triumph TR cars in the comments below. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.